to the Bad Labs policy roundtable number 30, in which we're talking about the digital payments opportunity in Pakistan. My name is Ambar Rahim Shamsi, and I'm head of content and communications at the Bad Lab. Uh, now, what COVID-19 and the pandemic has shown us is that consumers can change behavior. This has been a kind of game changer in terms of uh, digitization, whether it is in terms of online payments, whether it is in terms of um, uh, how people uh, work, how people uh, pay, how people order the order food as well. Uh, but one of, uh, but it's important to also note, I mean, given uh, how the State Bank of Pakistan has recently released its uh, report on the payment system in Pakistan, this is backed by numbers as well. So just uh, talking about some of the numbers here, internet banking users have increased by about 30%. Mobile phone banking users increased by 20%. E-commerce merchants increased by 61% or 69%, if you will. Uh, internet banking transactions grew by 108%. That's, that's a massive increase. Uh, mobile phone banking transactions grew by 177.6%. And e-commerce transactions grew by 63%. So in the last 12 to 18 months, what we've seen is consumers are changing behavior. They're changing the way that they uh, uh, perform transactions uh, and pay and, and use banks as well. Uh, but the question really is, how many have been left out of the system? Can we make this uh, more inclusive? Uh, and what are the opportunities, what the state bank, what role the state bank would play, as well as um, uh, fintech services, not just legacy banks? but new players that are coming into the market. We've got a fabulous panel with us uh, to discuss all of these points and many more. I have questions about PayPal as well. Uh, we have with us uh, Mohammad Yar Hirad Saab, who is a board member and CEO of OneLoad. We have Mubari Siddiqui, who's an independent legal practitioner and um, you know whose uh, expertise is in corporate advisory, finance, acquisitions, banking, media law, competition law, intellectual property. We have uh, Umar Salimullah, who is the chief operating officer of Sada Pay, and Ari Reba Shahid, who is a business and economic journalist for Profit Magazine. Thank you so much uh, for joining in. Um, and, and I'm going to sort of begin with you, Ariba, to sort of set the stage for this. Uh, Pakistan lags behind perhaps other countries as well in terms of how many uh, people are included in the banking system. Um, as well as how fast we're moving in terms of enabling fintech, fintech services. So if you could set, sort of set the, set the stage in terms of how COVID-19 has shown an opportunity. There's a lot of noise. Thank you so much, Amir, for having me over. Um, can you get rid of the noise? Anyway, so I'm just going to move on. Um, so with COVID-19, with a lot of going wrong with the world, one thing that did somehow manage to set Pakistan on track was the digital payment system in Pakistan. So with people in lockdown and the and you know steps taken to encourage people to stay at home, uh, digital payments were given a push. People were suggested to to, to use IBFTs, use online uh, payment systems to to pay their bills, online shopping, things of the sort. So COVID-19 actually set the stage for a greater revolution in the sense that it, it made it possible for um, the regulators and, and stakeholders and parties involved to, to actually work on policies that would encourage more people to use it. Because the situation where people were in, they used um, these systems, these payment gateways, these uh, payment solutions, more than they did before. And uh, one thing that made this easier was the fact that transfer, uh, the cost of transferring money was reduced or removed. Uh, so things like that happened. And we, we heard of RAS, which we will get to later on as well. So uh, during this one and a half year of COVID-19, what we've seen is uh, a stronger inclination towards digital payments and inclusion um, by 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 all stakeholders, including government, the state bank, banks, all included. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So the, sort of that sets the stage, and we we talked about some of the numbers as well. Mubadis, if I could come to you here, because um, what we've seen here is that even though the numbers look good. Um, a lot of the volume of the transactions is actually just through um, ATMs. We know that cash is king in Pakistan. Um, 
if you could talk us through how what the what the next steps should be and and you know perhaps include rast in this because it launched in 2021 um first phase um you've already seen how upi in india um has has changed the game over there as well and they're looking to sort of branch out internationally so if you could talk us through uh, how rast for instance is is different from one link how this makes it easier Thank you very much uh, for having me. And uh, yeah, uh, as Arima rightly said, the context around how COVID enabled uh, a lot of uh, people to move towards digital channels of number one consumption, uh, which inevitably meant uh, that more people would want to transact online. And then when more demand was there to transact online, more sellers wanted to sell online because the opportunity was right there. Um, I think one important aspect that we, we do not consider is uh, or, or, or often overlooked is that the number of businesses that are willing uh, to adopt digital channels of trans, uh, transacting and selling their products um, and have just been waiting for the infrastructure around it. Now, uh, while it's a separate topic around what the banks need to do, uh, I think in terms of what the state bank has done to enable it has, uh, has been this biggest move around RAST. Uh, number one. Number two, even RDA to an extent, uh, because uh, before I come to Ross, RDA, what that has done is has told all the banks that, listen, you can open accounts digitally. Uh, it might still be a broken process, but we can go ahead and fix it. I mean, it's 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 a start. It's a great start, actually. Um, the, that big uh, bubble has burst around keeping everything paper-based and the fact that it can't have you on paper. Banks have been solving all sorts of KYC and other issues through uh, digital means. Uh, secondly, RAS, uh, while it's it's still not live entirely yet, but what, what it has done is it has made the infrastructure uh, through which the banks can operate and settle payments at the, uh, at the back end um, more easily. Like, like to give you an example, uh, currently in Pakistan, uh, we, we still can't have, have a lot of SaaS related products because recurring billing and, and a regular subscription payment is still not enabled by any bank. Uh, now, this is just one use case, but generally what Ross has done is provided us with the and the banks the infrastructure to uh, essentially uh, enable a much larger volume of, of digital transactions. And state banks next step towards CBDC, which is a central bank digi uh, uh, digitized currency, a digital currency is, is, is another crypto initiative which would help uh, the bank uh, state bank uh, to settle payments for the banks more easily. So we are take, making the right moves and going in the right direction. Um, it's just about keeping momentum and uh, and enabling more Pakistani businesses uh, and people to transact digitally. So a supplementary question here then, Mubar, is what are the hurdles here? What are the challenges that you see? So making the right moves, that's fantastic, that's wonderful. Uh, there is clearly, the, you know, the, the, the game is ripe. What are the challenges here? The challenge is, the, or, the, or the biggest challenge, I would say, is um, is the dependency on cash. Uh, even if so, so let's let's face the reality now, right? Uh, there are a lot of businesses that have existed in Pakistan throughout the history, completely undocumented. It is still easier to do an undocumented business in Pakistan than a documented one, and that's that's the that's the fact of life. And most people. Uh, since their business always involved uh, uh, an undocumented means of, of, of transacting, they remain there. So if I am, say, for example, a manufacturer uh, and I want to pay all my taxes, I still have to make cash payments. I still, for which I cannot deduct from my uh, from my um, uh, sales tax uh, proceed. So you, the entire chain is still is still based on dependent on cash. People don't want. Uh, taxes to be deducted on source, uh, so companies would then have to pay in cash, otherwise their cost goes up. Uh, it's and other uh, people who want to pay taxes entirely to and uh, say buy more expensive things because you have to pay deduct tax at source, uh, they would end up losing to the competition because their margin wouldn't be as good. So it's it's this entire system is still broken, and then a lot more needs to be done to. Number one, facilitate more businesses to be documented from the beginning, and that involves having tax-related incentives and and making uh, starting a business uh, document business much easier. Uh, secondly, uh, it would we would also need uh, to figure out a way to align incentives with the existing players and and to bring them on a digital front. So there are two two streams of uh, challenges there. All right, uh, thank you, Hirat Saab. If I could sort of turn to you now. Because what it seems to me is that 
part of this the challenge is actually a sort of trust deficit as well, a reluctance to be documented. Um, and also, um, I think traditional banks um, just make it harder for consumers as well. So your take. Yeah, I think you're muted. If we could just unmute you. Yeah, yeah. sorry about that. Yeah, so it, it, uh, my uh, uh, just to, to put it in context, uh, we have a app called One Load, which works with mm -hmm. micro uh, retailers, so Panwala, roadside vendor, small shop uh, keeper, etc. So owner operated mm -hmm. businesses. Um, so we are very much connected to the sort of blue collar economy and the undocumented co economy. Mm -hmm. uh, for us, uh, the most interesting thing is that there, there is hardly any pushback on being documented. People are willing to, to give us their ID card numbers. They're willing to sign anything. They're willing to and want to be part of the formal banking system. It's just that the cost structure of engaging um, with the digital world is much higher than operating in the cash world. That, interestingly, is what we see as the biggest challenge. Um, and so one of the big steps that the state bank took was to make interbank fund transfers free digitally. And, and the banks have pushed back significantly on it. But basically, that was one of the biggest ways of, of sort of digitizing the economy. And now those charges have come back as of 1st of July. And uh, although there is a small threshold, which still requires that uh, th those charges not be placed. But the most interesting thing, just, just as a way of example, uh, my uh, uh, online banking, my personal online banking uh, with, with you know, three banks that I, that I use for personal reasons, um, they typically charge somewhere between 150 to 200 rupees for a digital transfer. So let's say every beginning of every month, I have to pay um, you know, my son's uh, tutor or um, you know, put money in my wife's account, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Let's say if I'm paying five people, so it's going to cost me 700 to 1,000 rupees to make those five payments through my online banking. Whereas if I call somebody from a courier company, TCS or something, uh, or just, you know, a, a day worker and say, please take these checks and deposits, deposit them at the respective banks, um, I can probably just pay them 50 rupees and get all those checks deposited, and there is no cost for me beyond that. Yes, there will be a bit of a delay, but the cost of doing it digitally, uh, as I noticed beginning of this month, because the charges are back on, that I paid about 1,000 rupees on 1st, 2nd July, whereas previously um, I was not. Uh, so, so one of the big problem is the, the structure facilitates and promotes cash economy simply because um, somehow the alignments are not quite there. So, so that is, I think, one, one very important thing that, that uh, we all need to solve and try and work towards solving. Now, the banks are very happy that those charges are back, but those charges are going to limit people like the Panwalas we work with. Now, what we did was very interesting, right? So we operate this app and people inject money, the retailers inject money, uh, through physical salespeople, as well as through banking channels. So we had shifted to about 80% of the volume going through the banking challenge channels to end up in one load um, because of COVID. And there was no problem of adoption, no issues um, cited as far as uh, documentation is concerned or taxation is concerned, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So we saw a little over within a, you know, a three month period, we saw a uh, little over, uh, you know, we, we are a smaller system, but we saw about 2 billion rupees a month start moving into our system through the banking channel. And now that the charges are back, just beginning of this month, so 80% of volume had moved to the banking channels. Beginning of this month, we are now projecting that this month it would be back to 50 50. Um, and, and that is primarily because of the charges that have come in. So these may be small things, but for the Panwala, a 50 to 100 rupee transaction is very is a big deal. And, and it's a big deal for companies as well, right? So we have 700 salespeople. We have to, if all of them deposit, uh, or do digital banking, and every one of them costs 200 rupees in every transaction they do with us, um, that's a significant cost. If they simply take a paper check and deposit it in our, our account, that cost is not there. 
So I think the, the structure needs to be changed and the incentives need to be placed if we want a documented digital economy. And I think that to, to me is the biggest hurdle. Um, I do think that the, there are a lot of progressive people uh, in, in Pakistan who want to change this status quo. I do think that the even at the low income, blue collar level, people want to adopt services. Um, but the, the, the cost structure is what really is, I think, the biggest, um, uh, biggest problem in, in this equation. Okay, so I mean, you know, I, I think what you've done is really busted that myth of how um, uh, small vendors in Pakistan don't want to be documented. They are keen. But as you said, it is actually the cost structure that's the problem here. And I think that lends itself to the next question. Omar, if I could come to you, uh, because it means that there is a contradiction. So on the on the one hand, um, uh, the there is there is obviously the pull of, of revenue generation. There is obviously traditional banks uh, that are happy with um, bank transfers being taxed as well or money being paid on that. At the same time, um, we want to push digital. So um, how, how does the government sort of, um, let's just say, walk that fine line between the need for revenue, even though we know the documentation is another is another um, uh, sort of goal or aim here? Yeah, you're not, <laughs> I'm not going to cry any tears for banks uh, losing revenue. Um, you know, I think they've, they're, they're okay. Um, but I think that uh, what uh, uh, Hirad Saab mentioned was literally, literally hitting the nail on the head. It is an absolute myth that the people of Pakistan um, at every level are, are, are avoiding digital payments uh, to escape the tax, tax net. That is not the case. So if you look at the tax to uh, GDP ratio, India and Pakistan are, are same, uh, we're 10%. Uh, India has 12 FinTech unicorns. Um, in terms of tax evasion, they estimate that almost $10 billion of tax evasion happens in India, but digital payments are, are thriving in that country. And I think the reason for that is twofold. One is that they had this uh, infrastructure around UPI which we're now uh, kind of adopting uh, through RAS. Um, the devil is always in the details. So I, I, I hope that we get the details right because not just the surface level, um, you know, things uh, that are there in RAS, but I'm very, very hopeful. Um, and the, the, the other thing is that um, free payments um, have to happen in Pakistan. If you make digital payments more expensive than cash, it's just not going to work at any level. I mean, Hirat Saab at his level knows how much he paid uh, for digital payments last month, right? Every, everything bites um, at every level. So it's madness for us to make cash cheaper than, than, um, than digital payments. There are banks in this country who are, who are issuing free checkbooks and charging 200 rupees for digital payments that I do from my own phone, from my own internet, uh, I don't use their branches. I don't go and sit at the branch manager's desk and have their coffee. But for somebody who does that, they're issuing free checkbooks. It's absolute madness. Uh, and, and this needs to change. It changed during COVID. You saw a spike, uh, uh, you know, immediately uh, when, when it happened. Uh, yeah, I mean, of course, COVID uh, being, you know, uh, making people stay um, homebound helped, but I think the real game changer was free IBFTs. And so uh, for us to go back to the status quo is madness. Uh, us at Sadape, we have not levied any charges on IBFT. It's still free at all levels. We're eating that cost. Um, and you know, we, we believe that the only way to scale digital payments in Pakistan is, is to make it more convenient and cheaper than cash. So the convenience factor is there already. Uh, again, people experienced that during COVID uh, when it was free but it has to be cheaper than cash it, it cannot be more expensive than that so so so, um, so just just sort of in terms of your experience with sadape if you could talk us through that i mean if you have kept them free how do you you know uh, maintain how, how do you sort of balance the cost versus the convenience uh, look so we're in the fintech space and within the startup space so our business model is a little different I, we're not we're not going to start making a profit from day one so it, it's it's a little different uh, from our side, so we're in the we're in the business of of gaining 
uh, users at the moment. And and I think that that uh, we're just hoping for Rust to come in and, and make it free for us. Like the thing is that uh, we're definitely not in the business of charging fees for every time somebody transacts with us. That, that is madness. Um, and so right now what's happening is that because of the IBFT charges that are taken from us, we have to eat that difference. But we're hoping that when Rust comes in, it makes it uh, more cost effective for us. But I'm just saying that from a bank's point of view, when an average small town, small time bank makes maybe a five to 10 billion rupee profit for them to turn around and say to, to state bank that, hey, the, the, you know, making IBFT free is really costing us. It's it's really hitting our bottom line is is it's ludicrous. And that's what they did the entire time when this this rail was free. So. Uh, I'm sad to see these charges come back. I'm, I actually am, am, am really, really sad to see these charges come back. State Bank has walked that fine line that you were mentioning, Amber, in which they have said that uh, cumulatively, if you do less than 25,000 rupees um, you know, in, in the month, you won't be charged anything. So it's, 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 it, it covers a lot of the, the lower population of Pakistan, which is, again, State Bank's um, you know, uh, incentive to get that uh, layer of society into the into the digital payment uh, ecosystem, but I still feel that it should have been just made simple. It should have just been free uh, across the board, and uh, banks can earn a lot of money from a lot of other places. They're they're not they're not starving. That's for sure. So so just as mobile or telecom companies were able to pressure the government in, in, into withdrawing some of the additional taxes in the budget, the banks you could say were also able to you know, use its leverage as well. So Arib, I'm going to turn to you now because we've talked a little about Ras and, and you know, Omar has talked about how he's betting on Ras to change the game here a little bit. But when you see uh, uh, the digital payment systems or, or markets in, in other countries, it isn't just, for instance, uh, something like Ras, which is, you know, uh, uh, makes digital payments easier and links everything together and makes it smoother. But it also it is also fintech unicorns, as you call them, who lead the charge. PayPal, for instance. Um, so, you know, as a business journalist, where do you see, I think, the leadership in terms of who's going to lead the charge here in terms of the digital payments opportunity? Is it going to be Ras? Is it going to be legacy banks? Because they do have that consumer base, for instance. Um, they do have uh, their products that, that can draw in consumers. Or do you think it is going to be uh, smaller fintech services? Yeah, so, so the question is really interesting. And, and we've talked a lot about Rust as well. Um, so Rust is going to be a game changer in the sense that it's going to make transactions easier uh, and it's going to make them, in a way, cheaper. But if we're talking about who's going to lead the revolution, I would honestly not think that the revolution, uh, that, that legacy banks would have anything to do with it. Because um, like, think about it, if they're uncomfortable at IBFT transaction fees, uh, you know, being waved off, even though they make money off different verticals, you wouldn't expect them to be the, the pushers, leaders in this change. So um, like, like most of the panelists we have, I too am kind of uh, upset over the fact that we have to go back to paying IBFT fees. Um, so there's that. Uh, but when we talk about Pakistan and we talk about the system we have right now, uh, with the number of uh, uh, startups and fintechs and you know solution providers that are coming up and which we're covering every week, like and it, it's it's come to a point where there are more stories than we can write. <laughs> And it, it's absolutely brilliant. And we're, we're moving towards the right direction. There's, I, I have to give you that. Uh, the regulator is, was, the regulators are open to listening to, to new ideas. We're, like Mbaraz has mentioned, we're looking towards CBDCs as well. So it, it, it's really forward looking at this point. So I'm, I'm, I may sound very optimistic, but I would, I would like to reiterate, I don't see like C-Banks doing this. Uh, I don't see them even coming close to doing this. So, so there's that. Um, but yeah, um, one one thing I'd like to state, which is a little maybe off uh, tangent right now, but the fact is that we talked about the money uh, required when you're transferring money from one person to another, but we also need to think about the fact that the population of Pakistan is not like you or me. There, there, are, the population is not us. We're we're a bubble within the population. 
so the, the the process of transferring money or the process of making payments needs to be more intuitive in, intuitive for people that this does not come naturally to and that is something i feel that uh, the fintechs are somewhat lacking at so that that is something that is interesting so you can't have a digital um, pakistan without this All right. So, I mean, you've talked about how there's so many stories and you're struggling to sort of keep pace with them. Could you talk us through some of the uh, problems that lots of new fintech um, companies are offering the solutions to, the kind of problems? Because one of the issues here is that a large percentage of Pakistan's population is unbanked. The other problem is that a lot of women aren't included in, in, in this revolution that we're talking about we, we, we financial inclusion is really really important uh so what are the problems and and how are, i mean just a few examples of the services that are being offered and i know that we so, have two examples here as well sitting on our very august panel so i'm mindful of that so so when we look at uh when we look at the funding that these uh startups are able to raise every single pitch deck or document has you know that says Pakistan's a huge population and there's a lot of potential. So that potential um, can never be achieved unless you get more people to get towards you know the formal banking network the, uh, to, to be banked, right? So that is something that we struggle tremendously with, and that is is more of a Pakistan thing than a regional thing or a religious thing. It's more of a Pakistan. Thing. And, and when we talk about that, it, it makes it very difficult because one, you've got a huge population, yes. Um, around half of the population is women, okay, fine. You've literally almost like reduced Pakistan to half in terms of who you're catering to. Uh, and Usma said, he, there's so many people that do not have bank accounts. So for these fintechs or for these startups to actually make it big is for when we deal on a mass scale or when their product is used at a mass scale. So so, for instance, we've got Sada Pay right now, and um, I'm still on the wait list for, for using it, and I'm, I'm still waiting. But, <laughs> um, my, <laughs> but my point is that, you know, even Omer would agree with the fact that until and unless he doesn't see um, a large base, it will be difficult to, to, you know, get the right investment or to, to, to scale up operations mm -hmm. to the extent that they actually become self-sufficient at what they're doing. So that is one concern that I have. Um, but yeah, there are lots of startups that are working really well. Um, but again, financial inclusion is one thing that we cannot ignore. Uh, there, there have been lots of talks going on. Uh, the state bank is working on policies as well, and they're talking to stakeholders. And, mm -hmm. and this time around, the policy that we're making for female financial inclusion is something where we're not just releasing pink checkbooks or making the bank pink. <laughs> we're trying to think beyond that. Um, mm -hmm. And, and with, with smaller players coming up, with microfinance banks coming up, with um, the telcos coming up, these these wallets have also been a tremendous boost. So mm -hmm. to be honest, we've, we've got a lot going on. And uh, like I said earlier as well, um, legacy banks won't do anything. These, these, these off status quo people are ones that are going to make changes. Yeah, I think that naturally lends to uh, questions to Umar and Hirad Saab. And I'm going to speak to Hirad Saab first. So legacy banks, perhaps not there. They cling to certain traditional modes. Um, it is people like you who perhaps would lead the charge of the revolution. But at the same time, I think the struggle here is that if um, there is a large uh, a, a population size, and that is women particularly, who are not included, who are not banked, um, what are some of the ways that smaller fintechs or new fintechs uh, can can include women in these systems? That's a, a very good question. Um, so I, I'll try to personalize it to, to what we are trying to do, uh, just to put it in context. Um, so we currently have about uh, 45,000 active small businesses using our uh, our wallet, our uh, retailer wallet. It's mm. not a consumer uh, offering. And none of them are women. And so these are typically owner operators who are, you know, the prime example would be a roadside vendor or a pan bala or a parking lot attendant, et cetera. And they sell financial services. They, you know, they can sell you mobile airtime. They can deposit money in your EasyPesa wallet, et cetera. Mm. 
uh, through the one load app so uh, and for every transaction they do they make money so we were approached by several um, large sort of uh, donor agencies um, from around the world to try and capture women um, because this sort of functions as sort of has a twofold function that if women are providing financial services so through our app you can open a, a bank accounts for for um, for a couple of microfinance banks that are our partners as well as mm-hmm. you know upgrade your uh, easy pesa wallet etc so the agent uh, or the our user is sort of a banking agent as well um so we were approached by um by many aid agencies to to see if we could somehow um run pilots and include say 500 women agents create 500 women agents and uh, and so you know uh, the statistics we operate on that every um every one of our agent serves say 10 to 20 people every day so if it's you know 500 women agents they would be serving 5000 to 10000 women every day um, making it easier for women to go to a shop and not have to announce their phone number in front of men etc i mean those are very big hurdles in fact in our yeah. society um and so uh, we uh, so we have uh, mashallah a, a large sales force now about 750 or so odd people in in the field and we canvass the country trying to find women run businesses and literally you know other than beauty parlors and we're talking about again our reach is not uh, you know really dha and and, and these type of places so we are, we are very much at the mohalla and, and grassroots level uh, we are outside of the upper income area so very different uh, target than i think the large banks and what not so there we were able to find some uh, women led uh, businesses um, so typically these would be you know low end versions of beauty parlors essentially places for women to to congregate hang out and and uh, you know be a support for each other and especially in places which are close to uh, factory areas where the men are all working in factories and women are actually paying the electricity and gas bills and and uh, you know managing the place what we found was interesting was that in those areas women had were actually quicker at adopting our product than the men were because there was so much uh, you know zarurat ijad ki maa hai i mean they they really needed those services so unfortunately there are very few of those categories of retailers so as far as uh, i think if again maybe um, we we we're learning about the society as we go along but you know when i when we started we embarked on the journey for one load there were all these sort of myths uh, that that i was told um, existed and and um, or, or what i was told were facts but i found them to be myths women are as uh, technically or financially savvy as men in pakistan um and and in some cases i think much smarter also in terms of being able to learn quickly and so we went to this shop and we actually had it documented for the purpose of um, Uh, one of our uh, uh, investors that this woman is actually has three children uh, she's managing um i couldn't go inside the 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 shop because it was sort of in front of a of a uh, of her house as well so somebody from the alums mba she's leading this project and she went inside made the video so this woman was juggling three kids had biryani on the stove was selling biscuits and and uh, uh, providing easy paisa transfers through the one load app all at the same time and it's it was fascinating that uh, and you know so so our project team went in and tried to teach her a new sort of feature that that has come about and it took her 20 seconds to grasp it and and and, and she said okay just get me going i don't have time to 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 uh, to study and yeah our male sales people were amazed at how quickly she could adopt it i think so mm-hmm. so the summary is that it's it's actually you know the exposure level uh, and the reach needs to be increased i think there's nothing fundamentally different in the gender uh, issue mm-hmm. um and and also in, in income issue i think it's just a question of uh, uh, not being uh, able to have access so when you provide access and opportunity um, uh, what we learned through one load is that pretty much everything equalizes i don't know if that answers your question 
No, it really does. And I think it's interesting where um, at one point, just as in terms of transport issues and women having access to transport, you think of a pink bus or a pink rickshaw, as Reva pointed out, pink checkbooks. But I think a little more effort to include women pays dividends. And Umar, I, I will speak to you about this as well and get your take on it as well. Um, because it seems to me that it you one uh, you know uh, one does need to make a special effort it also pays dividends would you would do you think that's true uh yeah absolutely um i think when we start talking about uh digital payments in pakistan we kind of default towards the financial inclusion play uh which doesn't need to happen um i feel that pakistan is a solidly middle class country um, I mean, according to a study that was done by Ogilvy and Mathers, we will be a, a, a middle class of 122 million people by 2025. That is more than the combined entire population of UK and Canada. Like if you add all the people up, you get more, um, you get less people than in our middle class. So I, I feel that um, there are uh, different uh, verticals that uh, fintechs can go in. And, and try to solve problems for. Um, the thing about uh, small fintechs like ours is that we need to be super focused. We, we cannot be everything to everyone. Mm -hmm. I think the wallets like Jazz Cash and Easy Pesa have done a phenomenal job in, in solving the problems of the bottom of the pyramid. And Pakistan has come a long way and, and owes a better gratitude to, a, to, to these wallets uh, mm -hmm. for solving very, very serious problems when it comes to Hawala and Hundi. Uh, things have improved significantly, and it wouldn't have been possible without Easy Pesa, Jazz Cash, Upesa, Zong, um, and so they've done a phenomenal job. So for us, uh, particularly, we're we're a solidly middle class play, and uh, when it comes to the middle class, uh, we're uh, you know uh, agnostic when it comes to men and women. Uh, we've been told that our colors are uh, very um, you know feminine. Uh, and so, so we like that. We like the neutrality of, of uh, what we're offering. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, uh, I mean, as far as we are concerned, uh, we're we're going after the middle class, both men and women, and that's that's how we scale, inshallah. All right, uh, Mubaris, I'd like to turn to you now because I think there's a question here as well that's been answered, but but I'll just sort of read it out as well. Um, so, um, in terms of the comments, Sami Amin had asked. Uh, a question for the panelists about the fact that payment systems are charging consumers for every transaction. And we talked about IBFT. I hope if, if uh, some of you missed that, perhaps a quick response on that. And they charge a small fee, uh, normally 15 cents, talks about how PayPal never charges consumers, even they do. Uh, so, uh, Umar, if you'd like to address that before I move on to Mubariz, I have questions about PayPal and, uh, and cryptocurrency. I'm very interested. Um, so I, I think the question was around the PayPal fees, if I, yes. if I got that right. Yeah. PayPal charges a lot of fees. Uh, I don't know where people are getting this uh, this thing that PayPal doesn't charge anything. They, they don't charge anything if you transfer between PayPal and PayPal, which is, you know, no, no bank charges for intra uh, transfers. But anytime you want to send money abroad or you want to invoice somebody, you're looking at three to five percent, uh, you know, over the cost of Mm -hmm. So, so I, uh, I I don't get the point where anybody's saying that PayPal is a charity. <laughs> okay, all right. So, question asked and answered. Mubariz, I'd like to turn to you, and because I want to segue into PayPal, because um, you know Pakistan has recently been included in the Amazon sellers list. Uh, there was also a petition that went to court. It's also been discussed on this in the Senate as well in terms of uh, why PayPal isn't coming to Pakistan. For instance, it makes it easier for um uh, uh you know exporters for instance or or people who would like to use amazon to send money via paypal as a payment gateway um so so what are the hurdles there and and can there be a pakistani version as well yeah of course um i i know we have this long-standing obsession as well with paypal and this desire to somehow get paypal and I can, I can see some merit in, in that demand as well. And it's primarily, as you rightly identified, for the exporters. I, I see the, the, the reason why PayPal is, is, is preferable, and as Umar rightly pointed out, intra, intra PayPal uh, payments don't carry any fee, number one. Number two, uh, PayPal has a huge network. So being part of that network enables businesses uh, to, uh, to, be, to easily remit and, and to actually receive funds. Now, 
the problem lies on on our end as well right uh, where uh, our current banks uh, are are not equipped or or work for people who want to receive funds as effectively uh, their payments get stuck uh, they they're often questioned and um, random questions as well i can understand the concerns around kyc and there's a reason why uh, there's a fact affiliated concerns as well uh, but uh, no there's no reason why a bank in pakistan or, or or a service provider in pakistan cannot significantly improve on what the current uh, experience is and the current experience could be made much much better it may not be the same as uh, having paypal account but it could improve quite a bit uh, and it could work for a lot of people now uh, the other part of the question is around why do banks actually in pakistan charge fee and 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 uh, yeah hiraj also turned uh, touched upon it in quite a bit of detail i the, the problem is that banks in pakistan lack imagination uh, they do not uh, understand that there's a way for them to grow bigger and make a lot of money uh, by not charging transaction fee ali pay did not charge transaction fee <laughs> they actually utilize transaction data to offer financial services and that's what pakistani banks need to do they need to understand uh, that the bank that stops uh, charging ipfd fee and like sada pay is, is is one of those examples uh, but for the, say the segment that uh, yeah raj is talking about for retail etc the banks that do not charge uh, those fee would end up becoming banks of choice and once you become the bank of choice uh, number one you're making money through all those extra deposits that you get number two uh, you need to use that data in order to offer targeted financial services uh i'm sure all these uh, all these retailers could could get um uh, are, are very prime target for in uh, for for inventory financing uh, for just one example and then uh, you can also offer them personal financing facilities uh the problem is that the banks in pakistan love lending to the government of pakistan they love lending to the big blue chip companies in pakistan and the in the way the incentives are aligned is kind of easier as well right because if i have a billion rupees Uh, to give out a loan, I could either give it to say one big blue chip company, or I could give it to like a thousand, uh, like you know, a million rupee loans to a thousand people. Uh, the, the distributing thousand loans is much more difficult. It needs you to have a lot more data and and, and be able to analyze those uh, those risk that risk element as well. But that's the real opportunity as well because what Pakistani, whenever Pakistani. businesses are asking for uh, better banks and and what they're actually crying out for is a better user experience uh, digital is just a means to an end and the end actually is a better user experience uh, banks in pakistan do not really uh, cater to these businesses and that's why we are in the situation where we are where there's a very little understanding of uh, how how or or even actually regard or care, caring about the banks being like you know have uh, uh, wanting to have these uh, smes uh, or startups as customers so uh, that fundamentally needs to change that mindset needs to change and i hope the new uh, fintechs or digital challenger banks that come up will at least push the traditional banks in that direction so do you think that the competition would help in in digitizing banks uh, making their processes easier because uh, setting up a bank account is hard enough uh, they're very risk averse as well um, you know for instance um, do you think that startups and i uh, would be willing to take more risk and then and that would create competition mubaris of course uh, uh, like umar rightly said uh, sada pay is is not charging any transaction fees they're absorbing those uh, those costs and that would pay dividends because more people would want to use sada pay if it's easier to open a sada pay account if it's if it's cheaper to transact on sada pay why wouldn't more people use sada pay would this push a traditional bank into adopting a similar model and being nimble enough to uh, offer that kind of experience um uh, ariba seems to be of the view that absolutely no and i think anyone would be inclined to do that because i uh, believe that because the existing banks already making money they're making money through a different cons- uh, customer which is again we, as, as i said earlier the government of pakistan eventually the pakistani taxpayer uh, and uh, and and the blue chip company so uh, they're very happy with what they have and they clearly uh, seem to seem to be enjoying the piece of the pie that they have now as the pie is growing bigger uh, the fintechs and the and the sada pays etc would come in and number one help the pie grow bigger because they would bring in more people 
uh, uh, into the uh, uh, token bank accounts and and then you cater to a different kind of audience now what's what's wait even if you look at the pakistani middle class a lot of women uh, do not have bank accounts um, and i think that's that's something very important so just because you're not working at at uh, uh, at a particular company or you're doing a job does not mean you should not have a bank account just to transact it really um, and th this is a market that's 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 just not catered to by the banks and uh, and i think the challenge of uh, fintechs would would definitely address this and, and I think I just want to sort of end on this is that it isn't just that a lot of women don't have bank accounts. Actually, a lot of women don't have uh, smartphones. Uh, so that is another hurdle where you're thinking about apps. Uh, that's actually the fun, the first step. Um, and there's been lots of proposals that the Bad Lab has also proposed this that are perhaps and as well as telecom companies where, for instance, if the SRS emergency cash program could be uh, done through these pay, uh, through uh, these fintechs, it would actually make it just sort of jumpstart or at least you, you could get access to a lot of unbanked women. But I'm moving on, Ariba, I want to talk about documentation a little. And we touched on PayPal as well from a sort of consumer point of view, but also um, just in terms of, um, for instance, there, there's been a lot of talk about whether uh, FATF, the emphasis on documentation, uh, license fees, all of these are also hurdles where you have uh, other uh, payment gateways entered into the Pakistani market. We keep talking about the middle class and how big it is. So that market is attractive is is are these some of the hurdles um i'm sorry could you repeat the question uh, sure you were being sure speak? yeah yeah so the question here is um in terms of international payment gateways like paypal for instance uh, and in terms of documentation so money coming in money going out um you know proposals as well that you know the money that could be kept could be in us dollars all of these things is is uh, FATF and the stringent laws, is that one hurdle? Is it, is it um, partly because of um, a license fee, for instance? Is that, is that one of the obstacles? Even though we keep talking about this middle class in Pakistan, that is, is, is a fantastic market. OK, so uh, when, when we talk about KYC uh, limitations and uh, FATF issue that we face, it's 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 like a it's like a chicken and egg problem because the more people you have, um, oh, sorry, so you need somewhat less strict KYCs for more people on board, uh, and then with more people on board, there's more documentation, there's more transparency, and you may find it easier with better. Um, so it's kind of confusing when it comes to that. Um, but it is it is a hurdle. It is a hurdle, and. Um, and and uh, could you repeat the second part of your question? I'm I'm sorry, I I I, I still don't get it. Very wonderful. Yeah, I'm back and I'm uh, unmuted as well. The question really was: we talk about this fabulous uh, Pakistani market, and you see that in terms of the fintechs that are uh, proliferating. We see that in terms of, for instance, Stripe investing in a Pakistani uh, yeah. service as well, and that could be a jump start. But but. So these complex uh, documentation issues or, or license agreements or, for instance, the process to sort of register, um, all of these things, are, are these obstacles as well? Do you see that? Or, or have these obstacles been removed uh, now that you know, RAS has been introduced, now that um, uh, the Pakistani government is looking to sort of jumpstart the digital economy? Uh, OK, so, so to answer that question, uh, so there, there, there are lots of things that one keeps that one needs to keep in mind. Uh, as far as these um, these solutions are coming in, as far as they're as far as they're concerned, um, the investment primarily comes from international investors. Uh, they make a big chunk of the investment. Um, that bringing that into a country like Pakistan essentially is difficult with hurdles like FATF as well, and also the regulatory environment over here. Um, you know. With enforceability of contracts, that issue, and um, with with issues with private equity and venture capitalism in Pakistan, and concerning the enforceability of a contract, that remains an issue, which which is completely different from uh, what we're talking about right now. Um, but in addition to that, uh, what is interesting is um, that considering the size of the population that we have, um, excuse me, considering the size of the population that we have. 
it's 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 quite um i i just umber can you please Sorry, sure, absolutely. So I'm going to sort of move on now to consumer rights because I think uh, I've talked about the the trust deficit as well. I asked that question, uh, but uh, there's been a, there's been a lot of concern about um, privacy, about uh, hacking attempts. So what needs to be in place in order for consumers to trust uh, the digital payment system? Uh, question for you, Hirad Saab. Um, that's a good question. I think the uh, you know the technology is uh, uh, has really moved to a place where uh, essentially consumers uh, uh, the technology can secure the workflow of any sort of use case to make things easier, better, faster for consumers without compromising on 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 their security. Now, in in Pakistan, or at least in, you know in in uh, some of the cases we see. Is that I think in Pakistan we uh, a lot of the apps uh, out there, a lot of the components of the financial system out there tend to be overly cumbersome to use. So uh, uh, I think uh, uh, if you if you go to the states or if you go to to Europe and you use one of the payment apps there, uh, they usually have very frictionless experiences. In Pakistan, to send money to somebody, there is often a two-factor authentication. There is an email password, then there is a SMS password. Sometimes the email password portion doesn't come, and the SMS password portion arrives late. And that by that time, your, uh, uh, your the time limit during which you can do the transaction has expired. Mm -hmm. So in Pakistan, I think we I'm not sure we have the balance right in terms of convenience and security. Um, the uh, you know there is over regulation also i think at low value transactions mm -hmm. and possibly uh, less regulation at high value transactions uh, 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 as i see it uh, but you know very simply uh, you know 6000 rupee used smartphones um, can be used to uh, secure people's accounts through biometric or facial recognition mm -hmm. and and as well as passwords that can be natively stored and only be natively uh, uh, accessible. So uh, I, I, I think uh, with due respect to to, uh, uh, to to the regulators, I think we are probably overly concerned about security to the extent that it actually compromises the user experience. And, and uh, we should also recognize that there are always going to be issues. I mean, in, in the United States, I remember uh, uh, when, I, uh, when I lived there, uh, a shopping mall I was close to my house. Somebody had planted a, a, a fake ATM there, and you know it showed up in the appeared in the newspaper a week later that uh, you know all transactions were all the the, the people were doing was people who had planted that fake ATM were basically just capturing your uh, copying your ATM card and capturing your your ATM pin. That does not mean that you stop using ATMs. Um, so it, I think the the security. Uh, uh, and convenience equation um, needs to be considered um, uh, in light of uh, of the new world. I May mean, give you an example: for a blue collar worker to open an account is hard enough, but let's say they open an Easy Pesa account. For them to send more than twenty five thousand rupees um, from point A to point B, um, they need to get biometrically verified mm. on every single transaction, and. And now that may sound a high amount for a blue collar worker, but an average blue collar easy pesa agent does two lakh rupees of transactions every single day. It's not like he's making that much money. He's only making 0.2% of that in commissions. But the throughput of an easy pesa agent who is blue collar, whose overall income is um, is probably the household income is thirty thousand rupees for you know three people or, or 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 three to five people or whatever because there are usually two people working there uh, etc at an easy pesa shop. So if you just look at that in one easy pesa agent to transfer money to another easy pesa agent, their working capital needs are very high. They're owner operator businesses. They're not part of the formal sector, and yet we want them to use a biometric method um, of of. Uh, in, you know, involving Nadra, a $200 device, a uh, device that often doesn't work on most of your fingers. 
Um, and and I, I actually tried it this morning. I was opening yet another bank account and yet another fancy <laughs> bank branch. And they tried all 10 on my fingers and told me that I had the wrong fingers with me. And half an hour later, those same one of the fingers worked. Uh, I don't know how. But the, the, these security issues, I think, are, uh, again, maybe I'm trying, I'm, I'm not uh, trying to be contrarian just for, for, as a habit. But I do think that we are, as the security concerns are probably, uh, 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 probably too, uh, are, are probably used as an excuse for bankers to not be creative. You know, that really surprised me, actually, because you hear a lot of obviously fear mongering in, in the press and media. I remember there a couple of uh, years ago, there was a there was a whole st a series of stories about ATMs and um, how your information was being, you know, uh, used via ATMs. And then you saw a, a lot of um, uh, sort of, again, as, as I said, fear mongering. But I think we're, we're sort of towards the end of this panel. Um, Omar, final thoughts, digital payments revolution. Is it happening? Uh, <laughs> big words. Uh, I, yeah. I, I think it's 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 starting to happen. I think that um, the headwinds of the world are going towards a certain direction. Uh, there are some organizations that are trying to resist these headwinds, um, but how can you? Like you could delay it. You could, you know, maybe stop it for two, three more years. But it's it's inevitable, um, and so I think that um, the the puzzle pieces are now starting to fit in. Um, I think that uh, the RAS rail is extremely important in getting this done. The digital bank license uh, is coming in um, very very soon, and so I think that will be the next progression for fintechs uh, to take. And then then they're playing with the big boys, um, you know. So. So that is going to be interesting. One aspect that we haven't really touched on in this talk, Amber, um, was Nadra. I think that Nadra's digital identity or digital stack needs to be unlocked and needs to be unlocked now. Uh, I think this is holding back innovation in Pakistan significantly. And so um, that is one point that the uh, lawmakers or the powers that be also need to take into account. I think State Bank has done a phenomenal job in again, uh, uh, threading this fine line between FATF and innovation. Mm -hmm. You know, whenever you try to innovate things, things get a little out of hand. That is what innovation is by definition. But then they have this huge pressure of these, you know, you know, these these, these geopolitical uh, powers uh, on them. So they've done a really good job in getting RAST off the ground, and then inshallah, uh, the digital bank license is coming in later. And then it's up to us. Then it's up to us to do the hard work. We've complained long enough, uh, and now it's time to put up and shut up. But I think what is holding us back a little bit now is Nadra. And so Nadra needs to unlock um, its, its stack the way the way India has the India stack. Uh, and so, um, so I think that will be the last key that unlocks this potential, this revolution, as you said, in Pakistan. You know, I've heard a lot of that from the telecom sector as well. And final thoughts, Mubarez. And, and I think I'd like you to answer another question that's come in from Zen, who talked about, and you mentioned FATF um, as well, Omar, uh, which is how FATF concerns come from, uh, sort of uh, anti-money laundering and the financing terrorism concerns come from FATF as well. What can we do? And, and your final thoughts, just to wrap up. You know, as, uh, I, as Umar rightly said, uh, what we have is, uh, uh, is, is one, uh, your, your digital identity layer missing, uh, which when it opened, it already addresses and makes it easier for more and more people to conduct KYC, uh, which should not be very hard. Uh, but um, on, the, on the fact of end, I think Pakistan has made uh, like considerable progress. Uh, it's, it's still a surprise where we're on the gray list. And a lot of it, you might think, can't help but think it's 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 a bit political. Uh, but coming back to what Yahya Raj said and our, our inclination and this obsession with uh, security, uh, let's, they, they, what, what people don't realize is that there's bank fraud as well, right? Uh, there's checks fraud, which is a paper instrument that there's fraud on that level as well. Uh, we had those fake accounts case despite our aversion to letting a normal person open a bank account without any issue. Uh, it's uh, These things will happen. They've been happening for, for decades or centuries. They will continue to happen. Uh, but uh, there has to be a balance between what you allow 
uh, to going forward and uh, and and how you how you find out new ways of protecting against uh, innovative innovative scams because they will not stop uh, so if 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 we have that mindset shift in the on the regulators end and on the banks end i think we can as uh, we can we can we are on the cusp of going and offering at least a cashless society to a certain part of pakistan i i don't expect it to happen for all of pakistan mm-hmm. uh, there's parts of pakistan which don't even have electricity so yeah. we have to make sure that uh, and i think u bank is something that comes to mind which is actually going for more and more uh, uh, branches because they're catering to that that segment and that's great uh, i i do i think we should not think of as one solution for all either because of the mm-hmm. diversity of the problems uh, and uh, barriers to access that the pakistani populations face uh, but when we talk about urban middle class which has phones which has uh internet uh they they should be going digital and that's how that will set the model for rest of pakistan as well as and when they get that infrastructure all right uh thank you so much shirat sahab final thoughts and i'm just going to add another question to your final thoughts as well and it it's really about if this digital payments revolution happens who will lose out ah who will lose out um so uh, uh first of all i'm i'm uh, uh, in summary i'm very optimistic about digitization in pakistan generally today and not just digitization of financial services but also that of the overall informal sector including supply chain financing general cost reduction of of uh, uh, of of logistics and and uh, uh, efficiencies that come from uh, use of technology and i think uh, a lot of the startup activity has also waking up traditional distribution companies traditional producers Uh, as well as financial services companies to at least start talking about and thinking about how to plan for and maybe react to to the world that is uh, uh, th- th- that is hopefully around the corner um so having venture capitalist fund companies with innovative team uh, innovative ideas and and great teams like like sada pay and, and umar is is on this panel and, and you know they have done a great job of of creating a narrative of of what a user experience should look like for the consumer etc that's a very positive step for the economy generally and and there is uh, and there are many other people and you know who are working away many teams working away at very you know every little aspect of of the chain so i'm very optimistic that at least you know a handful of those will become very will become highly successful and will uh, completely um, overall our 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 system, change our system yeah. um as far as who loses out i think anyone who fails to react to what's coming around the corner will lose out um and and uh, you know i remember uh, also reading up about how bookstores uh, ended up shutting down when amazon uh, came about yeah. you know that was and and that sort of stuff is going to happen um banks uh, commercial banks by definition are are very conservative they have a good thing going they have you know club memberships and and uh, expensive hotels to stay at and and boardrooms with nice air conditioning on they don't really need to get out of those and 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 leave the the confines of lahore karachi and islamabad so why why should they and they used to have a joke and it's not just pakistani bankers i mean they used to have this joke in 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 um, uh, when i lived in new york they had a joke that about commercial bankers that they are 363 meaning that you know they borrow at 3% they lend at 6% and they are at the golf course at 3 pm so <laughs> so they have a good thing going why should they change it um so uh, so you know anyone who f- who fails to change it will 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 lose out uh, however i do hear a lot of noise coming out from uh, and hopefully it's more than noise and it's tangible actions coming from most big banks are actually now creating uh, ways of working with fintechs Uh, whether through formal funds whether through relationships agreements um and anyone we talk to is very receptive to at least listen which wasn't the case uh, i think 3 years ago or 2 years ago and you know covid has sort of changed that so in summary i'm very optimistic in terms of what is going on not only in regulatory environment but generally the private sector eventually it is energies of people get mobilized in one direction the societies transform and change and i'm hoping and and optimistic that that will in fact happen uh thank you so much mohammad yar hiraj mubarak siddiqui ariba shahid umar uh, uh salimullah for participating in this we've got a few questions and comments and a suggestion for the next one as well because clearly this is a subject that you know 
Uh, there are lots of players here. It isn't just fintech or fintech startups. It's, it is, for instance, the telecom sector or the legacy banks as well. They have a role. They have a stake to play, as, as you pointed out as well. Uh, thank you so much for participating. Thank you so much for listening. Um, and I'm sure we would be able to arrange another one with another set of uh, actors and players.